Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction there. I think it's pointless to say that I'm really excited to be in front of you today this morning and to present this novel surface. For many years, I've been working on it now, and uh, this is uh, the first accomplishment that we see on this uh, novel surface. Uh, and uh, I'll, if you allow me, just briefly take you through the story behind what came up and how it came up, actually. And the story begins with solar cells. Uh, nothing to do with implants or medical or biology whatsoever. Solar cells were a group in, in, in Switzerland found that if they coat a layer of titanium dioxide on a window and then graft on top of that chlorophyll-like chlorophyll um, molecules, they will be able to produce electricity in that way. The key to the grafting was by a molecule based on phosphonate chemistry. These phosphonates have an extremely high affinity to the titanium dioxide and will create covalent, very strong chemical bonds directly to the titanium dioxide. So it's part of the titanium dioxide. Professor in Geneva, uh, Professor Pierre Descou, in physics department, he read about this. And he also knew about phosphonates in a different field of application, which is in the medicine. So treating osteoporosis, treating different bone diseases, there they also use phosphonated type of molecules in order to target the uh, pharmaceutical entity directly to the bone, because the phosphonates have an extremely high affinity to bone and calcium, uh, etc. So he came up with the thought, could we combine these two concepts, titanium dioxide with a high affinity to phosphonates on one side and phosphonates having an extremely high affinity to bone on the other side and to produce something new, completely unique for implants? And that's what we have done. That's what we have developed. And that's why I'm so excited to introduce to you Surflink. We call it Surflink. Uh, for many years now. It's based on this phosphonate type of chemistry. We produce a single small molecule with multiple phosphonates onto the molecule. And this will produce, once you put it in contact with the implant, a completely new surface. It's integrated in the surface chemistry, so it's the same surface, same topography, same nice uh, uh, structure that you have, microstructure, nothing is changing there. But on top of that, we put uh, this layer on the uh, integration on the oxide. So we exchange a few of the molecules. A monolayer is produced. The advantage of this monolayer is that it creates for the body, for the biology, something that looks bone-like. Secondly, it's a permanent biochemical bone bonding layer that is established for life. This is unique, this is new. We have researched it in, for many years, and I'll now show you some of the results that we have obtained uh, in this perspective. And some of the results stem from the unique properties that we have with this uh, new surface. One of them is that phosphonated type of molecules are extremely hygroscopic. They like water. Water is adsorbing into the molecule. So what you create, firstly, is a layer on the surface which is absolutely inherently hydrophilic. Water layer on top of the surface, which means that when proteins come onto the uh, surface first time, they will stay in their natural water shell and will not denaturate onto the surface. The result of this staying natural is actually that cells will colonize the surface quickly and in a natural way, as if it was a broken bone that they needed to repair. And we have studied it in sheep. So this is an example of histology from sheep. Two weeks after implantation, we injected a fluor for fluorochrome uh, and looked at where exactly is bone, new bone forming. So what you see in green here is actually the 
bone, new bone mineralization taking place. And what you can see is the profile of the screw perfectly depicted. And why is that? Well, it's because the bone cells go directly onto the surface and produce a new bone layer in direct adhesion and contact with the surface. So that's after two weeks already. After eight weeks, we can still see the green line on the surfling treated implant, while on the control implant, we only see new bone formation on the old bone and bone particles, nothing on the implant surface. Just to emphasize, these two implants were placed in the same sheep, in the same hip, and evaluated exactly in the same way, having the same other type of uh, uh, treatments. So they are absolutely comparable, and you can clearly see the huge difference that happens in the biology around. So what we can see is that active bone matrix is deposited on the sur implant surface with the surf link and not with the control. So that's a new feature that stems from the unique uh, properties of these molecules. In a blow-up, we can see even further that the different lines are different time points, two, two weeks first, four weeks, eight weeks, and we can see that it starts on the surface and then grows out from the surface towards the other new bone formation on the old side, so to say. So it closes the gap. It enables a new type of integration taking place. In a traditional histology, you would look at it like this, where you see in the white space here, which is the bone marrow, you see the implant is in all black. And between you have all these layers, with the blue, dark blue, being the newly formed mineralized bone tissue, the lighter blue, uh, unmineralized matrix being deposited by the osteoblast cells lining up the surface. And we can see them also in electron microscopy, the osteoblast working directly on the implant surface. Evaluated in histology, we could see that two weeks, classically, we have new bone formation on the implant surface, nothing on the control just beside in the same animal. After eight weeks, we could see a thick layer lining up around the implant and the thread here and connecting to the trabecula of the bone. So you will have a trabecular integration directly after eight weeks. While on the control, as you can see, nothing happened on the implant surface, neither at two weeks nor at eight weeks. Other properties that we looked at were the biomechanical uh, outcome of this. We tested torque testing at two weeks, eight weeks, and 52 weeks, so one year down the line, just to say in parenthesis, in sheep that corresponds to about two and a half year in humans. What we could see is that at the early stage, integration, as we saw in the histology, took place, produced greater fixation, produced more bone in the surrounding, and could allow for earlier loading. At a later stage, we could see still some greater fixation. The values are very high, but not that much greater. What we saw was a significantly better stability of the implant. We interpret that as the trabecular type of integration, the firm fixation of the new bone onto the implant surface allows for forces to be taken up in a more natural way and getting a better uh, fixation in overall and a better stability of the implant. And you might ask, so what does that have to do with the clinical situation? Well, what we saw also when we did a cut through the bone block and the uh, implant together was that actually when we did a torque testing, the breakage on the control implant without any molecules happened at the interface between implant and bone. So the bone was stuck by the uh, biomechanical uh, interlocking as always, but when we did extra forces onto it, it was loosened up and lost its fixation completely. While on the surfling treated one, we had the first layer of perfectly nicely bond bone, 
and the breakage took place in the bone itself, just outside, where you have normal kind of bone around it. So the first layer appeared to be staying very firmly onto the uh, implant. In a clinical situation, that would mean that if you overload the implant, you chew a little bit too hard, uh, that will, if you leave it alone a little bit, or the patient leave it alone, uh, will naturally remodel and heal again, which will never take place on the control implant without a, uh, the new surface. And in long term, if you continue and continue and continue, you will eventually end up with uh, the, the situation where perimplantitis might uh, uh, occur, while if you keep it healthy and remodeling, it will stay on the surface. So that's the clinical advantage of uh, this uh, uh, new surface. And just to say that another of the properties is that uh, there is nothing in the body, n nor pH or um, enzymatic activities that could in any case attack this kind of uh, uh, surface. So the phosphonates are perfectly uh, unaltered by all the uh, times. We have tested it in pH uh, ranges of 1 to 9, for example, which covers all physiologically relevant uh, pHs. Nothing is changing these uh, molecules over time. So that's another of the uh, unique uh, features and properties. Let me take you through a few other of the uh, biological implications. I said that we took the implant that was torqued with the bone block, and we cut it in two halves like this. We looked at the implant lifted out of the bone, so we took it out of the bone and we looked in electron microscopy on what is happening on the interface. What is the failure mode in the bone when we torqued it? And what we could see was that at this scale, nothing apparent is seen. You can see that the two first threads and the neck were in the cortical side of the bone, while the lower part and the apical side was in the trabecular part of the bone. So you can see some bone remnants. You can see uh, remnants as you should see on the both surfaces. But when we make a close-up, we can see that there is a slight difference between the new surface and the control where a huge block of bone was appearing on the, uh, the, the, the control implant, but there were new big blocks on the uh, surflink surface. But what was on the surflink surface was a full layer of bone, and here's a blow-up of what we saw, where we see the fracture of the bone in the, uh, on the surface itself, while the control surface we saw to over 90% a nude titanium surface, and this is after one year. So there's a major difference in how uh, bone is adhering onto the surface. Another interesting uh, little feature that we looked at was, normally when you look at histology and you see um, the, the bone marrow close to the implant, you would say there is no bone in contact. While we saw that in between the bone marrow, this is uh, bone marrow cells here on the top right of the implant, and in between, at the top of the thread, we could see that the layers of bone that was formed from the beginning actually are still there after one year in the sheep, making up a thin mineralized tissue in between the implant and the bone marrow. And this is unique. This is the first time anybody has seen or shown the, that happening. Another very interesting feature uh, that we found was that uh, something that looks like uh, blood vessels, vascularizations, uh, seem to appear to grow straight into the implant surface, as if the biology the bone cells did not see or perceive the implant as a foreign body any longer. And this is absolutely unique. So what we have created, we believe, is a new surface which is absolutely unique. It has a biomimicking type of chemistry, and it makes 
a bone-like surface uh, appear in a natural way, it takes away the foreign body reaction. It gives a permanent property to the implant with hydrophilic osteoconductive surface where the bone cells will produce early on a new chemically attached uh, bone layer onto the surface, healthy over the time. This will allow for enhanced fixation, earlier loading eventually, but also on long term. And we believe that this is essential, and we'll, we have seen that in the clinical evaluation, uh, that this is essential for patients with compromised bone uh, in different ways. And I will now hand over to uh, Marco Esposito to talk about the clinical evaluation of this uh, surface. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn, and let me introduce to you Professor Marco Esposito, who is Associate Professor in Biomaterials in the Zagrenska Academy of Göteborg University, and he's very well known to us because he's the Editor-in-Chief of the European Journal of Oral Implantology. He's also linked with the Cochrane Oral Health Group, and he's uh, well acquainted with uh, clinical research. I would say he's one of the top European experts in clinical research methodology. Marco. Thanks a lot. I have to uh, present some uh, clinical data about a new implant surface. And so I will present to you um, how clinical research should be conducted. And I present you the data. And then you will make up your mind. So the question that we have to ask is, how would you evaluate the efficacy of a new implant surface? Well, the answer for some people seems to be uh, difficult, but actually is quite simple. I'm talking about in clinical terms, in humans. So basically, we need to, co uh, to conduct a comparative study. So we need to compare the new surface with the gold standard, the best surface that we have at the moment, okay? And this is done in humans. This is very important. I mean, first you do the animal experimentation, you see whether this can work, and then you will see whether in clinics this um, can work as well, because sometimes in clinics that can be surprises. So when you do this, you're going to run a so-called controlled clinical trial. Controlled because you are comparing things, clinical because it's in human, and trial because it's an experiment. You are experimenting something new. Uh, however, there could be limitation. It depends how actually the trial is designed. And for instance, there could be a problem because you can choose patients in a certain way. So in some situations, clinicians can choose patients with a good prognosis uh, to be in one group and patients with a poor prognosis in the other group, so they can affect the results. And uh, an example of this, I will now maybe make a little joke, is uh, when uh, in Italy they did a study uh, about masticatory function in uh, females, and uh, they build up two groups, and they end up in groups like this. And you can see that the masticatory function of one group, in that case, is a bit more advanced than the other one. So the two groups are actually not really comparable. So you need to avoid that. And how you avoid it? Well, there are two ways. First of all, you don't ask an Italian dentist to do the study. And the second, you give the same patient the same chance to be in one group or another. How you do that? You do it with randomization. So randomization will allow the balance of the group. Of course, if the group is very small, like this case, only four people, then you can toss a coin maybe four times and you end up to have four heads. So it's possible. So you understand that the more you will, uh, patient will be randomized, the more you're going to toss the, count, the, 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 the coin, the more balanced the group will be. And there will be balance for everything, for smoking, for um, response to uh, bone response, to how they clean, and so on. So this uh, uh, solution, as we call it, random, uh, randomization, uh, end up in the randomized control trial. So this is the ideal study design to evaluate efficacy, efficiency, effectiveness of any medical dental treatment. There are other aspects in the study that you have to consider. Uh, of course, you need to do a sample size calculation. You need to know how many patients are needed to find a difference. 
You need to do a proper randomization because you can still unbalance it. There are little tricks. And this is also very important. You need to have a blind assessor, especially when you are evaluating, let's say, bone levels that are subjective in the sense that sometimes is a B-dimensional picture. You can see superimposed things. So it's not always easy to see exactly where it is. And if you know what is the implant you are evaluating, then you tend to be uh, more optimistic or more uh, negative, depending on your uh, belief. And it's also important that we, in the studies, we have uh, a clear picture of what's happening, meaning that I want to know how many patients lose this, are, are a dropout. I want to know whether there are withdrawals. You should avoid to withdraw any patients because then people can suspect that you remove the one with the problems. And there should be a clear idea of the missing data. It can happen that data are missed because they are lost, but this has to be clearly explained. So now what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a pilot study. We have actually running two studies. One is the pilot study, which was the first one, and the other one is a bigger study, which is actually a replication of the same study, but in multicenter fashion. So I'm only giving you the data from the pilot study, but I can tell you that data at one year of the multicenter study is exactly the same. So we are going to evaluate the uh, um, clinical efficacy of uh, this uh, new uh, surface treatment. Uh, we call it SurfLink. So, of course, we are going to do a randomized clinical trial. But if we are comparing to implants only, we can use a special design. We can use the split mouth, meaning that the patients received both implant types in the same mouth. And this makes the comparison even stronger, because many other parameters are depending on the patients. And the patient being the same, then they are more under control. So, we started to, is a pilot study, is just to see the, 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 the safety and the efficacy. Safety is important, I would like to say, because I've seen by experience the launch of many new implants uh, over the years with no clinical data. I mean, they've been presented, they say the clinical data will come, and actually the experimentation was done by the clinicians. And some product was good, but not all the products were good. Uh, there were many cases where the product was actually inferior to the previous one. So it's important when a clinician makes a decision that there are solid facts available, okay? Not promises. So we start with 23 patients. It's a single center study. And uh, the data of the one year are already published. The data of three years are available. Uh, we can submit them whenever we wish to do that. So I'm going to present the data at uh, three years now. And we are now collecting the data five years. So we start to have some patients that reach the five years time point. So now I'm going to present data of patients that have at least three years, but some have reached higher time points. So very briefly, we try to include all the patients you're going to treat. Uh, for instance, we are including smokers and patients that have uh, uh, grafting procedures. Uh, as I told you, it's a split mouth study, so we have two implants, two single crowns, one of one material of one surface and one with a conventional untreated uh, surface. We also have the possibility of placing extra implants, and when we have to place extra implants, we decide to place a more uh, surfling treated. Why that? Because we want to expose the patient to a higher number of, of these implants in order to see what is going on, to evaluate safety. And in, in four patients, we had the possibility to place an extra implant. What, another aspect is that they were uh, submerged for three months in the mandible and six months in the maxilla. So it's a very, let's say, conventional protocol. But the interesting part, and this was allowed by the type of surface here, is that it's a quadruple blind study, meaning that the operator was not aware of what type of implants was placing. If you look at them, the treated and the untreated, you cannot discriminate them. The assessors were blinded. The, 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 the patients were blinded. And moreover, all the statistical analysis was done by a blinded statistician. So the codes were broken only after the analysis were completed in order not to have any kind of interference uh, in, the, in, the, in the study. So regarding the three years uh, data, we lost uh, three patients at dropout. One patient unfortunately died, but not because of the implants. And the two did not return over the time, but um, we know that one is still having the implants. The other one didn't show up after uh, the, the treatment. So 
we don't know exactly. Um, we have all the data. We don't miss anything except of a baseline radiograph. Actually, we have the radiograph, but it was in a bone grafted patient, and you cannot really see the bone around it because it was probably a changing area. So we cannot uh, put the levels clearly there. Everything else is available. So, most importantly, we had no failures. There is not a single implant which failed, not a crown that failed. So, from that point of view, very well. Uh, some complications, not too many. Uh, some complications are affecting both implants, and that is interesting to see, especially in a split mouse studies. So, we have uh, some pain postoperatively, which maybe was not actually related to the implant treatment, but for something else. And we have a case of uh, perimplantitis, and then we had another case of uh, perimplantitis. This is over uh, three years. Um, all the patients with perimplantitis have still the implants of five years, okay? So they are still in, uh, in, uh, in function. Regarding uh, hygiene, the patients were cleaning well. In fact, apart the one that had the perimplantitis problem, there uh, was no marginal bleeding. And uh, bone levels, um, were maintained over time with no difference between the two groups. Let's see now uh, the data at three years, and I would like to show you the bone levels. So the first line is the new surface, and the new line is the control. Now, the sample is small, so uh, you need a bigger number to find out statistically significant difference, but if you are going to evaluate uh, the difference in terms of medians, you will see that the surf link achieves 66% better than the conventional uh, surface. Uh, so we can say that the surf link is able to maintain over time three years bone level, and the difference with the control is in this range. Now let's uh, look about uh, evaluating patient by patient using this kind of, of graph. Each point is a patient. And then we see for each point we are comparing the two implant, uh, the two implant uh, surface. And we see that most of the points are toward the right side, meaning that they are favoring, the, uh, again, the, um, the new implant surface. And this difference tends to increase slightly over time. So it was at loading 43%, it goes up at three months, at 56%, one year, and then finally at three years, 74. All measurement fully blinded. Eh? So the assessor have no clue what they were measuring. If we go to take now a subgroup of patients, for instance, the smokers, because in patients that have normal condition, I would say almost any implant is working fine. The problem is when patients are not the ideal candidate. Let's say the smokers, for instance. Here you can see at three years, again, that the surf link is having a little better maintenance on bone level. Um, it's, it's, you, you can see here around 80%. Of course, the number of patients is quite limited. We are talking about six patients in this group. And if we do it for uh, in the maxilla, maxilla, you know, is, uh, is a bit uh, softer. Again, uh, after three years, there is a little better with the surf link uh, implants, and we are talking about 75%. So this is uh, now the, the, um, the few patients that have uh, extra surf link implants. So we know this. The other, we don't know which are because they are still blinded. But this one are the one that reached the five years. So one patient have an extra implant that have five years in the pilot study, and we have three patients that reach the five years in the uh, other study. And you can see the bone levels. They are all the patients that achieve the, the five years follow-up with the implant, so I'm not uh, hiding anything. And you see bone levels are uh, maintained in all of them, and then we have also the, 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 clinical, uh, the clinical view of these patients. All these patients are having the surf link implants. So let's conclude now. The first thing, and I would say the most important thing in this moment, would say that it's clinically safe, okay? There are no worries about bad surprises, as has been shown in the past. Second, we can say that the material, the new surface, is able to, is efficient to maintain bone levels over time, and we can say up to five years post-loading. And I would like to emphasize that 
you don't see a launch of a new surface which come out with data up to five years, always study with data three years. And uh, as I told you, we have two ongoing studies. They are not completed yet. So we are going on to, to follow them up. And now we are more than 100 patients enrolled. All of them achieved the one-year data. And this data from the two studies are very, very similar. Thank you, Marco, very much for this uh, presentation. And uh, as always, uh, we haven't been the only ones uh, working on this, and I just wanted to uh, say thank you to those people in different institutions who have been participating. First of all, uh, Professor Pierre Descou at the University of Geneva, who actually came up with the thought of combining the two uh, uh, concepts of solar cells and biology, uh, and also allowing me to come and work on it and uh, take it to the next level and through all this research, together with uh, Peter Pecci, uh, who is uh, a real brain in chemistry, let me call it like that. He has produced the chlorophyll-like uh, molecules at EPFL. He has produced the surflink molecules. He has produced new molecules for battery and energy conservation, preservation, etc. He's really fantastic, Peter Pecci. And together with our team at NBM, Sabrina Bucchini, Laurence uh, Germont, Nicole Levy, Richard Kernow, and many, many more who has, have been backing us over the years. And not to say, at the different universities, doing animal studies, doing clinical studies, uh, different parts, and also in the multi-center study, uh, uh, private clinics and university studies. Thank you to all of you who have been participating in this. And my excitement in the beginning presenting it to you is also with some proudness saying that today, Surflink, which was and has been a research concept for quite a few years now, is today taking a step forward with the enabling true OSI integration coming into a product line called B Plus with MIS. And I'm extremely excited to see what you, as an audience, as dentists, will do with it in your clinic's work and uh, with your patients. And with that, thank you all so much for your attention.